Hello, welcome to another Spotify Green Room Wagon Wheel chat. So if you're listening to this live, uh, you are in the room with me and you are uh, hopefully lining up to ask questions already or at least thinking about questions or thinking about something, thinking about life. Uh, if you're listening to this on uh, my podcast, uh, then uh, it's already been recorded and uh, you can join in um just by following Twitter, really. And uh, I usually put out the tweets there, telling people when I'm going to go live on the wagon wheel. And if you're doing this on YouTube, you can see my face. And uh, I don't really know what else you need to know. But if you do want to get involved with these Spotify green rooms, uh, the best thing to do is download the app, follow me, you get a notification, and then you come in and you ask your questions. And some people have already asked, well, they haven't already asked some questions, but they're already here. So Causa. Are uh, you there? Yeah. Hey, I doing? am fast today. Hey, you were you were right off the mark. Uh, so let's o- open up. You know something good. Uh, you know don't don't start with a wide one. Okay. You know, as the last um, uh, uh, yesterday, you know, uh, Australia got beaten by Bangladesh. A young lad called. Uh, you know, you'll have to watch him. You know, Ashif Hussain. It's kind of a batsman like Morgan and uh, what I can say that, you know, elegant, but they are not really test specialists. You know that they will not never play test cricket, just like, you know, Yubra Singh or any other, you know, David Miller. So they, uh, this kind of batsman. So why do you think yeah, the batsmen are coming? White ball bat. Yeah, they are white ball elegant cricketers, but you will not feel that they can play rainbow cricket. So, why do you think this kind of cricketers are coming uh, from our, you know, this systems? Because before, you know, when there were no ODI cricket or white ball cricket, uh, oh, no, this is, oh, uh, this is easy, Corsa. Corsa, I got you, I got you. This is easy. First thing is that we've only started taking white ball cricket seriously for about 30 years. So before that, everyone was trained to be red ball specialist. So of course you wouldn't have had many white ball specialists, right? So that makes that that that's the first part of it. The second part of it is, is that if you are Aaron Finch or Owen Morgan or uh, who else did you mention? You mentioned you've Raj Singh. I, I can't remember his test record off the top of my head. But those those sorts of players who are specialists uh, in white ball, usually it's because they have a weakness which in red ball you can't hide. You know, with Aaron Finch, if you put three slips in with him, um, he will eventually nick off. Uh, he nicks a lot. Um, and, you know, that is a huge problem. If you bowl the stumps to Aaron Finch in a test match, he's not going to be able to flick every ball over, you know, mid-wicket for six, and eventually he's going to miss one and he's going to go out. That, that sort of risk and reward in a one-day game can cost you a lot of runs. So there are very basic reasons why there are players. You, you are talking about, it's called limited overs cricket, but in, in some ways it's a limited form of cricket that all the dismissals are not always available to you, all the fielding positions are not always available. Also, the pitches are flatter, so that helps very good um, stroke makers, and the balls are absolutely garbage. White balls are terrible. We don't talk about this enough. They're disgusting. They're painted. Uh, we have to have two of them in a one-day game because they don't even last, Right. So that, again, gives a huge advantage to someone who's just going to play through the line. If you're the sort of player who can play through the line all day, uh, you will be successful in white ball cricket more often than not. If you try and do that in red ball cricket, the balls wobble around a little bit. They do things. They, generally, they stay harder. They spin more. They bounce more. They do all the sorts of things that um, it's completely different. So it is a fundamentally – well, God, I did this last week, this whole fundamental thing. It is a completely different sport. Um, I think is the the best way of looking at it um, now, and uh, you know I don't, I'm not sure enough people who who actually are willing to ag- uh, admit to that. So they are different sports. So if you're asking why we have players who are good at it and players who are not good at it, it's because it's a different sport. So uh, my next question, I can ask one question, little question. Well, there's just a few people uh, 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 lining up. So if you want to line back up again, um, that's fine. But I'm just going to get to some of the others now. But Great, great question. Thank you. All right. Who have we got here? No one, if I don't press the button. Hey, Jared. Vicky. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a very 
a simple question about uh, how people perceive uh, test cricket should be played. Uh, so, yesterday... That is not a simple question. <laughs> but go. Yeah, whenever it was that, uh, when England, uh, in the recent series, uh, England was bowled out for 183 in the first innings by India. It was mm-hmm. swinging, it was seeming, all the pacers took the wickets and uh, they got bowled out for below 200. The same happened in Australia. When Australia were bowled out for below 200, more than a couple of times in the, re- in the recent series in January. So when all that happened, there was no uproar. It was all about people's batting techniques and all that, how they couldn't handle the moving ball. But when the same England versus India test series happened in India, and the same England got bowled out for below 200, the problem was all about the bowlers and the pitch. Is there a perception that if you get seamed out or swung out, it is the batsman's fault? And if you get spun out, it's the bowlers or the pitch's fault? Well, no, because I'm I, every time we ever talk about spinning pitches, all I ever get is the exact opposite from Asian fans who say, what about the pitches who swing and seam all the time? So, no, it just depends on your background, really, of what you think is more normal. I'm not, uh, I don't care either way, as long as there is a good bowling and good batting. Like, I don't care either way, but... There, I, I think people I, speak I think, about it. Uh, yeah. It's always in the wrong connotation. Like if, if if it's a green track, it's a very nice track, greenish track. But if it's a dust bowl, that there is there is sort of a bad connotation around the language that we use for spinning kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this question is asked almost on every wagon wheel, but fundamentally, you have to there is one huge difference between what you have just said. When England were bowled out for 183, it wasn't because of the green pitch. The pitch is not particularly green. It's because the ball swung in the air. That is something that cannot be controlled in the same way. Now, you can argue, if you want, that more grass on the wicket will make the ball um, uh, swing for longer. But to be honest, I think unless you have an actual abrasive surface, which you don't really make, it's just not something that is natural in England or or some of the other places as well. Maybe New Zealand is another place. Uh, The ball's going to continue to swing if the ball's going to continue to swing. These balls are swinging because the Duke's balls, for whatever reason this summer, are completely juiced up. And they cannot stop swinging. We haven't seen any reverse swing in a test match in England this year because the balls have just not stopped conventionally swinging at the moment. That's not the pitch. That is the ball and the conditions, which is a completely different thing from the pitch. If you were, if you were talking about massive seam movement, generally people do complain about pitches that have massive seam movement. Not, not me. I think, I think incredible seam movements are a lot of fun in a test match. But... People do usually complain when that's the case, but that is the big difference between spinning pitches and um, and uh, well English pitches, if if you want. It's that quite often the damage that is done on English pitches is not it has very little to do with the wicket itself. Um, I would say that the amount of seam movement I've seen in this test is not that much different than you would expect in somewhere like Australia, which isn't really known for seam movement. What we've seen is the ball is just ridiculously bending. It seems to swing more the later we get into the innings. I think. With India, it swung more after the 45 over mark than it did before that, which is absolutely baffling. Um, and uh, I would say that England seemed to swing it later in the innings. Uh, although, they're, what are they, about 25 overs in when it really started to bend around corners for them. Again, uh, you know, that's probably even late for a Duke's ball to start swinging at that amount. Um, so that's not a green pitch. That's not seam bowling. So straight away, if you're going to say what you're saying, you have to look at it from that perspective. The other thing is, and as I said, I do I do talk about this almost every green room, um, is that they are fundamentally different things. If the ball seems a lot on day one, it may not seem a lot on day three. If the ball spins a lot on day one, it's probably going to be almost impossible to bat by day three. So there are quite often different situations the way that they do that. Also, if the ball seems can quite often help spin bowlers as well. Even if the ball swings, it can quite often help help spin bowlers as the ball might drift a little bit more as well. Again, when the ball spins a lot, generally we don't see seamers. So there is key differences here. But there's also, um, uh, I don't want to say racial um, differences, but there are the Australia and England set the table on how we talk about cricket because Australia was the best team in it and England invented the laws um, and, and shipped it around to all of our countries. And uh, there's almost no spin in England 
And spin in Australia is something that you bowl in the middle overs when you're resting your quicks uh, before, you know, uh, uh, and rotate your quicks outside of a couple of great spinners that they have had. So, of course, they're going to see spin differently to other places. But we still have to get the facts right. If we're going to talk about this, we can't say, oh, look, England got bowled out for 183. Why is no one talking about the, the green pitch? Because it wasn't a green pitch. It had a green tinge, but it wasn't seeming around like crazy. So if we're going to talk about these things, we have to be accurate with them, and we have to actually understand all the different parts of it. So the, the, the opposite conversation to what you're having is, is terrible, but we ha- if we're going to have the informed conversation, which is what you want, you have to be accurate. You can't say that was a green pitch because the ball swung and the ball is swinging. And that is something that is not as controllable, especially in England, where the pitches are just not abrasive. They're not abrasive surfaces. Outside of occasionally you might get one in Manchester. Um, you, you, yes, you, okay, it does happen uh, at the Oval. But most of the pitches aren't abrasive. So the balls don't fall apart. They stay together. And for this particular batch of Duke's balls, they're nuclear when they, when they stay together. They just keep swinging. I, I think when India started swinging the ball massively, I think it was in Boomer's second or third spell, I assumed it was a reverse swing because the ball looked like it wasn't, it, um, it, it was a little bit dinged up. And then um, I think Mohammed Shami came on and started swinging it. It was quite clearly conventional swing again. Uh, it's phenomenal the way these balls have managed to continue to swing up until the 79th over until they're getting replaced. I, th- I can't remember. Was it one of the New Zealand, I don't know if it was the World Test Championship or the England game, where that the ball was swinging so much in the 70th over conventionally, uh, sorry, 79th over, that I'm not sure they even, they were talking about not taking it, uh, the new ball. Uh, what a remarkable situation that is. And that's not normal for England. Generally, it does stop swinging. Reverse swing plays a part in England. Spin generally plays a bigger part in England um, after the 50th over mark. That's not been this summer. And sometimes you do get a batch of balls that are a little bit different. But um, great question. Thank you very much. Who do we have coming up here? Oh, where is he? There you are. What's your question? Just had it. How are you doing? I'm very good. How can I help you? Um, I just had a short question. Like, you are in jar. In mm-hmm. England or in South Africa, how are you going to get in? Uh, um, sorry, if I'm Pajara in England, how am I going to make runs? Is that what you're saying? No, nope. yeah, is, is that what you said? I'm, I'm sorry, you, 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 your, quite, your question was so quiet, I didn't quite hear it. Did you ask my if, question? Was if you yeah. are Pujara in yeah. England or in South Africa? How are you going to score your runs? Because you don't attack as much as you do. So if you just keep on defending, how are you going to get your runs? Well, I mean, I I don't really understand the question. Also, playing in England and South Africa is completely different. Uh, You know, similar wickets in the, well, similar the ball could swing, but different different balls and different pitches, I think, fun. Um, But, uh, how is he going to score? Well, he's going to score the same way he does kind of everywhere. He's going to take all the pressure. He's going to try and tire out the bowlers. He's going to wait for any poor deliveries. And he's going to rotate the strike when he sees it as a safe option for him to do so. I mean, Pajara doesn't bat that much differently to a normal English batter, I would have thought. He, he is probably less likely to try and steal singles. Uh, that's not really his game. He's a terrible runner between wickets as much as anything. And he's also, he likes to use the full face of the bat, perhaps slightly more than a traditional English top order player, where they will open and close the face a little bit more in looking for singles. But realistically, he doesn't bat that much different than an England top order player. Um, he, you know, Cook, um, Trot, all very, very similar players to Pajara. Um, uh, just that they are, uh, I think what Trot... What, Trot's strike rate is about 45, 46, and Pajara's is about 43, 44. Um, uh, he has a game plan where he tries to tire out bowlers uh, over time, uh, especially outside of Asia, uh, where he can't attack the spinners and, and make a bit of a mark there. Tries to tire out quick bowlers. He tries to negate their... Uh, he tries to essentially wait for a magic ball to get him out. Now, the problem in England this particular summer is I'm not sure you can tire out bowlers uh, particularly well because the ball's going to keep swinging, so they're going to feel like they're in the game a little bit longer. Uh, and also, you, it's very hard to negate the ball if it never stops swinging. Um, you can do that in Australia, because after if 
Pajara's faced 100 balls, the ball's probably not doing as much for at that point, whereas that doesn't seem to be the case here. Also, he's never made runs consistently in England, uh, which might mean that there are more magic balls in England. Um, and you do need to, uh, and, and his his method of waiting them out perhaps hasn't quite worked for him. But I don't see how he's going to change. He is Pajara. He's an incredible test batter around the world. And uh, we know what he can do. And his job really is going to be to take as much time out of, especially if Stokes is not playing, the one chance that India does have is perhaps tiring out the England bowlers. In this particular case, Sam Curran is a, I don't want to say a fragile fourth bowler, but he's not a regular fourth bowler in test cricket. Uh, he usually has that backup. Um, it's a very one-dimensional attack, the England attack as well. Uh, there's no you know, frontline spin option. So Pajara will probably bat the exact same way he does. I don't think he'll be successful, not because there's anything you know, uh, particularly wrong with his method, but clearly there is something within the way he bats that does not transfer to England. We've seen that in county cricket, and we've seen that in test cricket. He just does not consistently make runs. And uh, there has to be a reason for that, uh, whether it be technical. Um, I doubt it's mental um, at this stage. Uh, but I, I don't see how, I mean, what do we expect him to do? Start playing switch hits or closing and opening the face? This is not his game. He has his game, and he's very good at it. Is Pujara really getting good balls, or is he now making good? <clears throat> No, if he's getting good. The similar pattern. Yeah, he's getting out to similar patterns. Absolutely incredible test match balls is what he's getting out to. He's getting out to Pat Cummins bowling leg cutters at 90 miles an hour. You know what I mean? Like he's getting out to phenomenal cricket deliveries. Um, uh, and it takes a phenomenal cricket delivery to get Pujara out. You're not going to get him out with a bog ordinary delivery. Thought the delivery to get him out in this particular, you know, t in this particular innings was a really good one. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly understand your question, but I, I don't see how, uh, I, I really don't see how he's going to change his game now uh, when he's 100 years old and he knows what he's doing. Whether it works or not is a completely different argument, but I'm not sure that Pajara has the ability to uh, play in a different way because he's so single-minded and one-dimensional. So he's either going to work this out or he's probably not going to be around by the fifth test. I think that's very, very fair. Uh, thanks for your question. I just got one coming through from Connor, who says he's uh, working at the moment, or doing some schoolwork at the moment, so he can't quite talk. But he wants to ask my opinion on Australia's lack of batting depth. Uh, Australia's lack of batting depth, I would say, goes back to the generation of which George Bailey, Mark Cosgrove, I'm trying to think who else probably missing a couple of names there. When they came through, that was the first generation where I saw very, very talented batters probably not get to the level that the players had beforehand. Now, it could just be that there is a bad batting generation and perhaps I was just expecting, you know, Cosgrove, Bailey, and, and, and I'm not picking on those two because I, I think they're both very good players. But, but you could put Voges in this, maybe perhaps Marcus North, the period before that, guys who I thought were of similar talent were averaging 45, 50, and then suddenly people started averaging 35, 40. They didn't dominate county cricket in the same way. Now, perhaps English cricket um, had gone up. They didn't do, uh, do that. When they came into the test team, they looked a lot more flawed. Uh, and the, nothing has really changed in that. And then if you go through to the next generation, you've got uh, Curtis Patterson, uh, well, Michael Klinger probably goes back in that um, uh, original uh, generation. So you've got, then you've got Curtis Patterson, you've got um, Nick Maddinson, uh, Chris Lynn. Again, you have incredibly naturally talented players. In this case, Curtis Patterson uh, you know, made that 100 when he was a fetus in Shield cricket. Has, has, has did okay when he played in his tests, but I don't think anyone thinks he is a test-quality player consistently, and he certainly hasn't made the runs of a test-quality player consistently. Chris Lynn and Nick Maddinson got sucked into the white ball cricket. Uh, and Chris Lynn, I still think, in another generation, probably goes on to be an incredible number five or number six for Australia. Um, his eye and his ability to play seam bowling specifically is on another level, but he doesn't have a fully formed game. Now, how much of that is the big bash being thrown in the middle of the summer? Probably has a, a role to play. But as I said, this goes back well beyond the big bash. Uh, Australian batting standards have been dipping for quite a long time. 
the fact that they had to go back and find Chris Rogers, for instance, who was of that previous generation to shore up their batting. You could argue, I suppose, Adam Voges is another one. Um, although for a long time in his career, I just think he didn't fully um, use his talents to the best of his ability. But there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that there is a weakened batting um, in Australia all the way through um, the levels of cricket that you see. Uh, someone like Travis Head has massive error, uh, errors, massive um, flaws within his game, and yet he's continually pushed because I, I don't think they believe there's someone else. Matt Renshaw was thrust into the team despite the fact he could pretty much only score on one side of the wicket when they, when they found him. You know, they're looking for, you know, absolute gun young players and there aren't fully formed um, young players. E even Cameron Green feels like... <laughs> I can see why everyone was so impressed by him, but it was quite clear from almost the very first ball he faced in Test Cricket that he plants his front foot uh, and that's not a great technique for DRS. Now, white ball cricket has played a part the splitting of the se season has played a part. Also, the, the second 11 competition that was devalued by Cricket Australia probably has played a part. But I, I believe at the moment, for whatever reason, Australia is producing much better bowls than it is batters. Now, that might have something to do with the shield wickets. There could be a bunch of different things. But it's, it's a concern. But I would say it's been an ongoing concern for a long time. And Australia has, I don't want to say ignored it, but not focused on it. And it hasn't been fixed and it hasn't fixed itself. That suggests to me that it's not a period where we just haven't produced good batting talent. It's a produce it's a period where we haven't developed these guys into better batters, would be my my guess. Uh but uh, thank you very much for that, Connor. I have are you? Hey Jared, how are you? Very good. What's your question? So I wanted to firstly uh, you know say that I really loved your answer on the Olympics and you know on on Australia being a multi-sport country, I, I absolutely agree with that statement and, you know, I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you. And my question is actually something that you might you have spoken in the first two months, but I have already uh, uh, thought about it since the last uh, last week. So my question is that, do you think cricket balls are uh, need and uh, need some, uh, have some space of improvement? Do you think a uh, pink ball is completely, uh, you know, is the right, uh, does, does have the right, uh, uh, you know, uh, dimensions and one and the and my thing is that why do you think there are three? Di why is why is there no case made for having just one manufacturer manufacturing the ball like B tubes, Kukabura or SG, and that being the ultimate uh, ball used, and rather than having three different major manufacturers defining their uh, uh, you know uh, market. Okay, yeah, I've I've got I've got all that. I, I I'm obsessed with this. So let's start with that last question. I think you need to understand the fact that SG are experts in making balls in India and Kookaburra and Dukes are not. So straight away, I think you would have a problem if you were to expect Kookaburra or Dukes to perfect a ball in Asian conditions when it has not been their stated aim for a, a, a large part of their existence. Secondly, I think the absolute worst thing we can do is make one company the ball manufacturer and I will uh, point this out by saying that Kookaburra make the white balls and they're still shit, right? They are the white ball ODI T20 ball of choice and they are an absolutely dreadful cricket ball that is not up to scratch. Now, this is not just Kookaburra's fault because they have to be painted. You can't dye the leather uh, white. So I do understand that. That's not just Kookaburra's fault. But fact is, I, I really do think we, we could have a better limited overs ball now if we had um, more co competition in the market. In fact, I think we would have better test match balls if we had more competition in the market. So I would prefer more um, cricket ball manufacturers. But you have to understand, I, I, it was really interesting. I was talking about this with um, Jeremy Coney, uh, Adam Collins, um, and uh, I think Nigesh Raghani, uh, uh, yesterday, we, we, we're, we're doing the commentary on this test series. And well, during the rain break, we were talking about balls. You have to understand how small these companies are. Dukes is like a tiny, tiny little company. Platypus, who, who, who was Australia's test ball for generations, was this factory that I used to go past on the tram when I used to go into the city. Um, and it was this like tiny little place. And yet it was the test ball. We think of these companies, and even Kookaburra, every time someone slams Kookaburra, Kookaburra go out of the way to go, we're just a small manufacturer of, of sporting goods. They're not like this big, they're not Nike or Adidas, right? That's what I want. I want Nike or Adidas or 
Puma or Reebok or anyone to be like, we want to get involved here because what we really need is that competitiveness. Uh, we want the skills of Duke, but we want we want the um, uh, finances of these big companies because we want people investing in it. To go to your your point on the pink ball, the pink ball is nowhere near as good as it needs to be because no one spent any money on it. At best, at absolute best, $5 million was spent on research and development of that ball. And it wasn't $5 million. It was probably $2 million. It's probably a million and a half, right? And when, that includes shipping people out to the UAE to face it and, you know, getting Raul Drava to face it and all those sorts of things. We're talking about a billion dollar change the pink, the pink ball can make. You're taking test cricket, which is played in the daytime, which gets daytime ad revenues and putting it in prime time, which would mean prime time ad revenues. The difference there is astronomical of what you could do. The pink ball could literally be worth a billion dollars in a 10-year cycle, and we spent less than $5 million researching it. And it's, it, it's not good enough, right? And we continually do this. So, no, I want a space race between the ball manufacturers. I want everyone involved. Uh, I, if, if, the, if the ICC was run properly and not run by the boards, so it was run as an independent thing and... I think the best thing they could do is go to all the biggest sports manufacturers in the world and go, do you want to have the test ball? We're going to have a competition. Let all of them pump half a million dollars of research into it to see if they can come up with a better cricket ball than what we currently have. Maybe there is a cricket ball then at that stage that can be used on every surface. Um, But yeah, the way that we choose cricket balls, the way that we talk about cricket balls, the way that cricket balls develop, I just don't think it's good enough. And uh, there's some incredible people that work at Dukes and Kookaburra and SG um, and we're not backing them with, uh, because our sport is not run correctly. Um, essentially, does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Jared. I, I, I kind of get the perspective of having Nike and or Adidas have been the reason. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Beautiful. Thank you very much for your question, mate. Thank you, Jared. All right. What I got next? Oh, Corsa's back. Corsa, what's your follow-up? I'm back. Okay. So... You know, what do you think about the future of cricket analysts, the computer analysts, you know, like you mm, are working with uh, uh, the CPL team, I really can't remember. I've worked with lots of teams. Well, I, 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 I had only heard that one, you know, hard. No, that's all right. So when you're, what's your, what's your specific question there? So my question is, uh, you know, how did you start or how? How to start from uh, scratch, like me, you know, starting and uh, hoping to start. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't start from scratch when it comes to being an analyst because I was basically headhunted from being a journalist. Uh, Melbourne Stars were the first team who contacted me, uh, but I ended up working for St. Lucia Stars, who are now St. Lucia Kings, but they were St. Lucia Zooks. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was headhunted from being a journalist, but basically it comes down to this. What can you tell teams that they don't already know? That's what they want. They want information. Uh, we talk about analysis and we talk about, you know, all these different parts of it. I, when I talk to teams and they say, oh, you know, do you do Moneyball and do you do all, you know, what do you do? And I'm like, I do due diligence. I look up the things that people in cricket teams don't look up. I find things, I discuss things, I take a conversation from a cricketer or a commentator says something and I look it up to see if it's true and I, I, you know, and I crunch numbers, I look for more information and I try and uh, allow for my team to be as uh, educated as possible when they go into any particular game. Uh, And that is what I do uh, kind of consistently um, and that's why I, well, was, used to get work before COVID. (laughs) I haven't had anything since then. But that's that's what the gig is, really. You are, a, you, you are trying to get information uh, for a team uh, in any way possible. It's not just uh, you know crunching data. It could be anything. Um, I like to go down and watch the oppos- opposition train with binoculars. Um, <laughs> I like to see who's warming up for the opposition um, team, uh, you know, before a game. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I see from from an analyst, and that is what teams want. Teams want to know what they don't know. We all want to know what we don't know. Unless we don't want to know what we don't know. I'm very Donald Rumsfeld at this point. But thank you very much for your question. All right. Who have we got here? Oh, God. Missed his name. Uh, hi, there. Aditya. Can you hear me? Aditya. I can. What's your question? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask your opinion on what you think, uh, what do you think about the current state of uh, Wanda Internationals. Uh, to me, it feels like 
an extended form of T20s with, uh, I mean, with all these new introductions of these two new balls and all these uh, new power play restrictions with favor batsmen. This feels like, and like the ODA averages have shot up by like 50, 60 over the past 10 years. Like, I feel like they are more, I, I don't feel like watching ODAs anymore because they feel like an extended form of T20s where, where uh, uh, even the strategies in one day internationals have not evolved. As in like, in T20, we've seen uh, ex- enormous uh, understanding uh, over the last 10 years about uh, the different strategies and what to do and stuff. But uh, I feel like one day internationals are not uh, in that particular space. So, w- what do you think about this? Yeah, I disagree with you. Uh, we just saw a World Cup where everyone bowled bounces in the middle overs. And um, that's not an accident. That was a strategy that had come out of probably the last couple of years of one day cricket. That's not a thing that you see in T20 cricket. Um, partly because you can't. I think it's bowling consistent bounces in T20 cricket is so risky. Uh, a couple of top edges for six and it, it, it's a huge over. Whereas in one day cricket, it's like a couple of top edges for six, but eventually he, that person's going to hit the ball straight up in the air and we're going to catch them. Um, so that was a huge change. England have completely changed the way that we think about one day cricket. Surely uh, the middle overs, they are scoring at, you know, a run a ball in those middle overs. Uh, their batting order, you know, batting deep. They bat deeper in one-day cricket than they do in T20 cricket. Um, uh, have other teams caught up? Perhaps no, but that's why England won a World Cup. Uh, you've got teams like Pakistan and New Zealand who back their bowling attacks. Uh, again, not specifically something you see that much in T20 cricket, I, partly just because of the kind of format of the game. You, you know, if you've got Rashid Khan in your team, you might do it, but certainly New Zealand or Pakistan, um, uh, looked after the bowlers. But, I mean, you, I don't think your question's wrong in that there is a, there's certainly a push and pull between one-day cricket and T20 cricket. Uh, that is that is true. I I think you just separate the two by, I, I would get rid of the fifth bowler option in, in one-day cricket, make it 12, uh, 12 overs, or uh, what? 12 overs and 13 overs, whatever Australia uh, did in their domestic uh, competition one year. Uh, I think that is probably something that you, you can do uh, quite easily. Um, but other than that, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel that there's, I feel like it is a different format of the game. Um, but they, they still need to actually, it still needs to be a lot of runs because that is the way that white ball cricket is marketed. Um, but there's probably, there probably has to be like a, a very, I don't know, what would you call it? Like a very even, um, mix between T20 cricket and red ball cricket in one day cricket going forward if it's going to continue as a as a format uh, and we're probably we're a long way away from that but it's the most tinkered with format of cricket ever um and so i, I assume they're going to make 1200 changes between now and the end of my sentence uh, what do you think of like the averages which have increased over, uh, since t20's introductions like uh, i remember you uh, seeing odis where uh, 250 was the pass score now 300 310 three, like, especially in the world cup 300 310 were the pass scores so what yeah. do you think I mean, of that particular yeah sentence? i mean i the first thing you need to know is that 300 is nowhere near the pass score there's only been one team who has consistently scored um at a runner ball in odi cricket ever and that's england that's one team uh i think india scores at about 280 runs uh, as their as their general total, Australia's around the same. I think the average in one day cricket's two hundred and sixty four. It's not that high. We focus on a lot of the high scores. There's a lot of low scores in one day cricket as well. In fact, a lot of the regulations that they brought in, especially back if, about four or five years ago, we either had very high scores or very low scores, which is probably ideal for one day cricket. I would have thought. Um, uh, you, yeah, players are better at batting in white ball cricket now because they spend more of their time thinking about white ball batting and one day cricket. If you're, if you're someone like Owen Morgan or Joe Root, uh, Baba Azam, and you're, you know, an incredible batter, uh, Virat Kohli, uh, Kane Williamson, Steve Smith, and everything uh, is in your favor. You should be able to score at about five and a half, um, six runs and over without losing a wicket in white ball cricket. That is, that's what one day cricket should be. I think at a certain point, um, because that's never going to be able, that's never going to be possible in red ball cricket. The red ball moves too long. The pitches are, uh, you know, degrade quicker. Uh, usually more bowler friendly. Um, the balls are better. All those sorts of things. So you really, if if though, you know, if we can't improve the white ball, so they act like the red balls, and we can't because it's never happened. If that's the case, then I think 
uh, you're all, you know, naturally the scores are going to go up in, in white ball cricket and you're going to get fewer wickets. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Great question. All right. All right. I got path. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, what kind of experience do you think a, a, a test match batsman requires? Like, you know, I'm looking at the four current Indian test match batsmen, you know, Prithvi Shaw, Shubman Gill, uh, Mayank Agarwal and Gail Rahul. And uh, of course, there's Rohit Sharma. So like these guys have, they have like 15 years of experience, seven years of experience, like, like heavy, uh, 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 like competitive uh, cricket, uh, competitive test cricket. So like these, they, they have different levels of experience, but they are like, you know, they, they have, they're, uh, they're uh, similarly useful. Like you can select any two of them and expect them to, you know, do well. And, you know, so what kind of experience might be required to, uh, to select an uh, opener properly? Or is it just that they keep doing well and you keep selecting them? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, with Rohit Sharma, he has not faced enough, uh, you know, balls outside of uh, India, really, or Asia, opening the batting yet for him probably to feel completely comfortable doing the job. It, I mean, in a perfect world, what, what you would probably do is, let's say you had a young Indian opener, you would send them to play county cricket around the age of 18, 19, 20, and you would get them to play, you know, a season or two of that. So they got used to the ball moving at the most possible, um, you know, the, 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 the most lateral that we, that we get. Uh, you would then um, spend a lot of time with A tours, uh, probably in Australia and South Africa, or at least one or the other, so that they get used to pitches that have higher bounce. And then once you and once you've done that, um, it's just getting them to play as much as possible. But that's not how we develop test players. Uh, can't think of anyone who really does that. Maybe England tried to do that. Zach Crawley's father did it because Zach Crawley was. You know, comes from a, a, a wealthy family, um, but it's not a natural thing to be able to do. But realistically, that is how you would do it. But that's not how modern test cricket is played. Modern test cricket is you have to get by on your natural ability and the ability to adapt very, very late. So by that, I mean, you know, uh, K.L. Rahul doesn't play any first-class cricket. He gets one warm-up game and then he's in opening the batting. That seems to be a skill that players, whether it be batters or bowlers, uh, are having to adapt to more often than not now. Um, and that is part of the game, I suppose. In, in, in the same way in the old days, uh, making runs consistently was part of the game. Now, it's adapting quickly so that you can survive is part of the game. It's, we are not, we're not setting up these players to succeed. I, you know, I talked about this on the Polite Inquiries episode yesterday, where people were like, well, Kyle Roll hasn't played any first-class cricket, and he made 50, so why are we complaining that all these other guys haven't played any first-class cricket? If you want players to make runs consistently, you have to allow them to play consistently. They have to be tested in all different places. They have to learn their game. They have to adapt. They have to have constant feedback from coaches. Uh, they have to play in multiple different areas so they can work their game uh, in all different areas. That's not to say that Kyle Roll won't make a ton of runs this particular test series. But if you want him to be consistent test match player, he needs to play first class cricket and red ball cricket consistently. It's, it's going to be very hard for people not to be able to do that. Um, and you are setting up the players to fail, I believe, if you are not um, looking at that particular system. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it, it's a really good question. But we're, we do not prepare... I'm not even sure we prepare T20 players correctly, realistically. Um, and that's where all the money is. Uh, we, I think, we have a very, uh, you know, we have a very weird way of of preparing cricketers, and it comes from the sort of the history of cricket, I suppose, the way that we've always played it. And now, sport, the sport is so massively different than it ever was before, and that's uh, that's causing a bit of a problem. But uh, great question, uh, thank you very much. I have time for one last question. Is there someone here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. Bring it home, close so, up. Oh, is he gone? I wanted to ask. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, how much of an effect does the bounce of the ball have on how batsmen will see it? Like in the recently concluded India Sri Lanka series, 
he showed that Hasaranga mm-hmm. bent his knee to get a lower bounce and that was causing batsman trouble. Similarly, Jameson uh, has al- also has a weird bend kind of and but still gets bounce. So how how does it impact? So, well, if, if you're facing a ball, bowler that bowls, um, let's say that their natural length is six meters, and if you're facing Kyle Jamieson, if it, and he bounces the ball on the six meter part, uh, part of the pitch, you're expecting the ball uh, to tra- uh, to bounce about twenty centimeters higher or fifteen centimeters higher than uh, an average bowler. If you're bowling with a lower bowling action, say Lasif Malinga you're expecting the exact same six meter ball to be way lower. That's a completely, those are two different shots at that point. With Jameson, you can probably play a back foot shot, either defense or maybe try and punch him through the covers. Uh, with, with Malinga, you probably want to be on the front foot. And even though he's landing the ball around the six meter mark, he's still a chance of probably getting you out LBW. Uh, whereas with Jameson, that's probably not the case because of his height. So that you've got two bowlers and two completely different extremes there of meaning that you're going to have to play differently for each player. Um, so that's huge. And, you know, you see it with Asian batters when they go to Australia. The, you know, the, they come forward to balls and end up with their hand. They get hit on the gloves a lot. And you see it with, especially, I would say the pitches the most, that's most common are, you know, Bangladesh and the UAE, where you see Western players, quite often Australian and South African players and sometimes New Zealand players, uh, who naturally see the length and they either get stuck in the crease or they go back and the ball's just not there. So, you know, those are those are certainly problems that you have and you have to adapt to. I remember being told uh, once that uh, when the ball bounced higher than normal, Ben Stokes was one of the most elite batters in the world. When the ball bo- uh, bounced lower than normal, Ben Stokes really struggled. So Ben Stokes would probably prefer to face Kyle Jameson or Mornay Mork or, or Mitchell Stark, even though they're all cause everyone else trouble, then he would to be able to face someone like Lassif Malinga or um, uh, I'm trying to think of someone else who, who shoots the ball through a little bit lower. Um, perhaps someone like Kima Roach um, who, who, who shoots the ball through a little bit lower. So, you know, different players like different things. I think that that's very fair, but you, you certainly have to adapt your game to the way that the ball is coming through. If, if you are, if, if, if Kyle Jameson's pitching the ball, let's say at five meters, most test players would be thinking, well, I could on a, on a flat pitch, I can drive on the up here, and this is a flat pitch. If you try and drive Cole Jameson on the up, chances are your bat is not going to be completely straight. It's going to be on a slight angle, and that extra bounce will, will take an edge. Whereas that, you're not going to get that kind of dismissal with someone with a lower ball, you know, either someone who's shorter or with a lower bowling action. So the, the shots that you play have to be, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, I don't know if you've ever played cricket, but I, I always struggled with taller bowlers. Simply, once it went above, once they went above about six foot three or six foot four, I had trouble just looking up higher, which sounds really stupid. But I was so used to looking at a certain spot, just when the hand came from that little bit higher, I really have trouble. I can usually, after a little while, get used to it after about 10 or 15 balls. But Sadly, I'm not that good. And I'm usually out well before then. So it is it it is an adjustment looking slightly higher or slightly lower, um, you know, uh, at different kinds of bowling actions. So it does change the shots that you can play. So a big yesterday's wicket of Kohli to Anderson. Did the ball bounce extra or was it just the swing that swayed Kohli into play? Uh, well, uh, Jimmy Anderson doesn't generally get extra bounce. But that particular pitch yesterday, if you have a look, there was a lot of balls that were fizzing through and basically not even making it, and, and, and some others not even making it through to um, the wicketkeeper. There's a lot of balls that the wicketkeepers have taken around their feet in this game. And also a lot of balls that have got, you know, uh, uh, Josh Butler's been hit twice in front of his face um, on the end of his fingers. That uh, says to me that sometimes these balls are coming off the pitch quite fast, and sometimes these balls are coming off the pitch a bit slower. Um, and that is, that's not bounce. That's, it's almost something, uh, I mean, it affects the bounce, uh, which might affect your shot, but that, that is almost something completely separate. So Jimmy Anderson can release the ball from the exact same place, six balls in a row. One will come off a bit slow. I, I can't remember who it was. It might've been Kyle Rule who scooped one up to point. The ball just didn't come off the wicket. I don't think his shot was particularly terrible, but it didn't come off the wicket correctly. Um, 
and then you you saw a lot of other edges when the ball uh, flew through. But yeah, I don't think Anderson's was um, about the bounce. Um, it might have been the pace that the ball came off the wicket, but mostly it was just about the outswing um, and the fact that he's Jimmy Anderson and he has uh, 600 of those wickets. But thank you to everyone uh, for your questions. Uh, another very fun uh, Spotify green room. So as I said, if you want to be involved, follow me on the Spotify green room app and you will get a notification when I go live. Uh, but you can listen to this on Red Inker if you came in halfway through, and we usually put them up on YouTube as well. But for now, thank you very much. Oh, there's a great podcast I did with um, Estelle on Sri Lankan cricket, uh, for any of you who haven't um, heard it. Um, it and if, if you are Sri Lankan, maybe it's best that you skip it, if we're being honest, because it's, it's not good. But for everyone else, it's right there. And we've got a bunch of really cool videos coming up on YouTube soon. We've just been uh, falling a little bit behind on them, but there's... a. Uh, uh, there are some very entertaining ones and some very weird ones coming up. I, I suppose very entertaining and very weird. It's kind of my wheelhouse at a certain point. But thank you all for listening.